you guys got your Bibles, turn them to the Gospel of Mark. For you guys that are new here, we are, we are going through the whole Bible. Starting in, it, We started in Genesis, we finally made it to the Gospel of Mark. Mark is so unique. I, I thoroughly enjoy my study, my being able to share with you the, uh, uh, the who Mark is and why he writes what he writes and how he writes and how the Spirit of God moved Mark basically Gentiles and the passion he has and he kind of skips around in the uh, uh, the life of Jesus. It's not exactly chronologically correct. Um, so you really got to kind of be on your toes as you're reading the Gospel of John. He he does not, he leaves a lot of things out that uh, Matthew puts in and that Luke puts in and that John puts in. But I think there's a specific purpose, what Mark is trying to get across to us today as readers and to the New Testament church of that day as readers, of, you know, what he wants us, you and I, to understand about Jesus Christ. So uh, let's pick up, uh, well, I want to start reading at verse 9. We d- went over this last week a little bit, but we're going we, we're gonna to go all the way up through, I think, uh, 20, 28, uh, verse 28. So if you have your Bibles, follow along. I read out of the New Living Translation. We're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, starting at verse 9. One day, Jesus came to Nazareth in Galilee. And John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee, where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last. He announced, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Then they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee, John's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called to them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, which is a Saturday, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, began shouting, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of the man. He ordered, at that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazed, people gripped in the audience, were gripped in the audience, and began to discuss what had just happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even, Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Last week, um, you guys that weren't here, I'll give you last week's sermon, and then I'm going to take an offering again because you didn't pay for last week's. So, no, I'm kidding. I should, though, you know, because it was good. Last week, basically what I said was, we all go through a desert time in our life. You know, Jesus was recognized as who he was, the Son of God. When he was baptized, repenting of his sin, that he... And, and, and heaven's cracked open, and, a dove, and all of a sudden you hear with a thundering voice, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And then he goes to the desert. And we get that in all the Gospels. He just, and he's tempted. He's tested. So for 40 days and 40 nights, he's in the wilderness. And, and if we were in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, that wilderness would mean, would mean everything evil is there. Every temptation, everything that could trip you up, everything that could take you down, 
Everything that challenged your spiritual life is there in the wilderness. All of it, all at once, that's the wilderness. And that's where Jesus goes. That's all Mark says. He says he goes to the wilderness. Now within those words, if you do a word study, you find how awful it was, how tough it would be. Because that's the way they understood it. That's the way they would understand. But he instantly comes out the other side. And when he comes out the other side, there's something that unique that happens. Because here's the deal. We know in the Gospel of Matthew that when he comes out the other side, this is what's said. What's said is that this is, this is Jesus. His pride was tempted. You know, his, the power was tempted. He was tempted not to have to go to the cross. All of the above. If he would just succumb to the devil, he never did. And listen, what, what, as we go through the gospel of Mark, what we are going to see is this. We're going to see, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see that the demons, that Satan himself recognizes who Jesus is. That after 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness, he wins, Satan loses, and Satan knows it, and they do not know what to do. The evil does not know what to do, because he was the demon slayer. He won. He came out the other side totally victorious. And very seldom do we see him tempted again. He knows he has to face the cross, and we will see that. Because we're going to see it right away with John the Baptist. He says, uh, uh, verse 14, it says, Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. And then when it says in verse 15, The time promised by God has come at last. John the Baptist was the one that was prepared to, to let everybody know about Jesus. Okay? To... Make the crooked way straight to prepare people's ears, the message that they were going to hear. And, and John the Baptist is beheaded. But it doesn't stop the good news, which is Christ. And Christ is eventually going to die also. But the time promised by God has come at last. And this is after John the Baptist. And he says, he announces the kingdom of God is near. If, if you were a Hebrew reader... If you read this, you would understand the importance of a kingship. The importance of the Messiah being the king. And, and if you understood that, you would understand why there was the, when, when we see, when we see they, they, they put, when he, when he finally came back to Jerusalem and they, they put palms and they, they, they wanted to treat him as a king and and, and they wanted him to be their king. They wanted to, to, to overthrow Rome. They wanted, but, but that wasn't it. His kingdom is, is so much bigger. But while he was there, he is the king. He is God in the flesh. And so his message is, the kingdom of God is near. And so he says, and, and this should be almost like, this is one, one action at one time. So he says, repent of your sins. So what, what that really means is, uh, turn away. Whatever you have faith in now, whatever you, whether it's money, you know, your, your pride, your power, stop it. Whatever you are worshiping, you are not supposed, you're supposed to worship God. So he says, repent of your sin, whatever that is. He says, stop. Now, no, you go, oh, well, sin, you know, is it murder, stealing, lying, cheating, adultery? What is it? You know, come on. That's because just being a dude or being a woman is, is it's not a sin. No, there's definitely idols behind this. There's definitely parts in your life that you go, God is not God of my life. Because that's what he wants to be. He wants to be the Lord of your life. So he wants you to stop whatever is keeping you from letting God be the God of your life. And, and I don't know what it is, but he said, the kingdom of God is near. So he says, repent of your sin. 
And he's just saying, and they understood idolatry so much. We don't think of idolatry because we just think it's part of a culture that we've had, that we, we need to possess certain things and take care of certain things and live certain places and make sure our possessions look good and all that stuff. And, and he's going, no, 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 that, that could actually be idolatry. And they all understood idolatry. And so he's going, no, you gotta, you got to repent of your sin, whatever the things that, other than you believe in God, and then believe the good news. And, of course, the good news, last week I said, the good news is Jesus. He is the good news. Good news equals Jesus Christ. He is the good news. That's who you believe in. You believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the good news. So repent and believe, it's like this. It, it just goes together. Repent and believe. It's 180 degrees the other way. You stop and you start. And you put your faith in God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to repent and believe. So you stop and you start. You know what? Uh, um, Some of you have probably gone through some crazy uh, temptations. I don't, I don't know how to say temptations, tests. Uh, the book of James tells us that count it all joy, folks, when you encounter various trials, various tests, so that you remember that your faith is real. 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he says, you will never be tempted greater than what you can handle. So you're never going to be tempted to the point where you're just going to sin. No, God always gives you a way of escape. And whatever trials you may go through, when you go through the, the Whopper Doozer ones, I want you guys to go in your minds and think of the Whopper Doozer trials in your life. You know? What are they? Were they addictions? Were they uh, coloring outside the lines in your marriage? Uh, was it a divorce? Uh, was it a really bad experience where you work? Was it something you lost a son, you lost a daughter, a death in the family? We all go through dark times in our life. Now, you either come out of that good maybe in the middle or just you you just you don't we you've had these moments in your life and God says you, you need to come out the other side really good you got to trust in me now Jesus, after 40 days and 40 nights of just going through whatever he went through, we can see all his tests in the Gospel of Matthew. We'll see him in the Gospel of Luke. But when he came out the other side, instantly we see that all of hell recognizes that he is the Son of God. And you're not going to mess with him. Whatever difficulty you come out of, Lying, cheating, drinking, carousing, just whatever place you were, when you finally come out of it and you are tested again and again and again and you win and you do not go down that road again and you, you don't go down that road again, what happens is the devil understands who you are as a man or a woman of God. And it actually gets easier not to sin. It actually gets easier not to sin. You don't have to. You know, uh, I know a bunch of people here that are uh, uh, were alcoholics and drug addicts. And, uh, um, you know, the longer they've stayed away, the longer they go, yeah. Don't need it, don't want it, don't care if they ever have it again. It's funny, my dad, he quit smoking a long, long time ago. He's 89, he's going to be 90 maybe. Well, you know, I'm hoping so. She's driving my mom nuts, so I'm not sure she's hoping so. Kind of weird, you know what I'm saying? Like, Frank, knock it off. 
Hey, it's it's weird when you get old like that. And, uh, you know, and and uh, he smoked most of his life, and and he always says, you know, Ken, if I have a cigarette, I think I'll just start again. So I'm not gonna have one. And I'm like, all right, Dad, fine, don't have a cigarette. You want a cigar? Yes, I'll have a cigar. <laughs> but don't give me a camel. I, I think the point that, that uh, Mark is making about the Son of God, that he is the good news, he is the gospel, that you, you go through a difficulty in your life and you see God work in your life, he carries you through whatever that difficulty is, and you go, man, if God can help me through these difficult times, the rest of my life, it's not going to be that bad. And so that, I think, is his prayer. That is, his, that is the deal when we follow Jesus Christ. We repent, we stop, we turn, and we believe in the good news. We believe in Jesus. Now, as that happens, that's the beginning of his message. Then he says, one day, verse 60, one day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they were fishing for a, a, a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me. And I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A rabbi of that day, a rabbi did not say, you know, follow me, I'm the rabbi. People would go, oh, I want to follow that rabbi. I want to follow this teacher. I want to follow, because the rabbi, that's what it means, teacher. But Jesus was not like, he was not your normal rabbi, because first of all, he was the son of God walking around. And he looks at Simon and his brother Andrew. Uniquely different than the other gospel, because we're only going to look at four that he calls right here, right away. And he looks at them and he goes, hey, Simon, Andrew, quit fishing. Stop. That's their livelihood. That's where to stop and follow me. Now, this is huge. This is, not, this is a life-changing decision. This is like Jesus showing up at your job, and you're making a lot of money. You're very successful at what you do. And he goes, hey, stop what you're doing and go be a pastor. And you go, no. What, are you nuts, God? Do what? You want me to do what? Oh, I want you to be a missionary in Zimbabwe. No. No, I want you to stop what you're doing and just come follow me. And you know what's really bizarre is that's what they did. Man, I wish you could understand it in the Greek the way it isn't written in the Koine Greek. Because it's just like they stopped. And the Holy Spirit got a hold and they said, all right, that's it. I'm following you. And isn't it amazing, out of 12, one went bad, he hung himself, fall off the rope, under the bunch of rocks, and his bowels burst all over the ground. I love that. It's in Acts chapter 1. You can read it sometimes. It's, so, it's one of those gross things, but then Paul was there. And, 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 but isn't it amazing, the commitment they had to follow Jesus Christ, that we still talk about him today, and it changed the world. Now, that's commitment, man. That's following. That's that's all in. It's hard to find a man or a woman of God that's all in. Because what we like to do is we want to be in as much as we can afford. Right? Okay, I'm going to be a Christian, you know, like when I'm hanging out with Christians. That's cool. You know, I'm going to church today. I'm going to look holy. Except if you go to the rock. We do not look like a holy group of people. We look, just look like, we really confuse people when they go, Are, do those people go to is that really a church? That green building? Is that some kind of a cult over there? What's the deal? But all in was all in in their lives, all in in their heart. And they were all winners. So a little while later, after they stop, I mean, they just stop. They hit the brakes. They put their career to the side. And they follow the Son of God. We see this. A, a, a little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men. So there's four guys that Jesus called. And you'll notice that Mark gives us their names. You know, Simon, who's going to be called Peter, Andrew, uh, James, and John. 
Wednesday nights, I'm starting our, our new uh, service on Wednesday nights. It's, it's, I'm going to be teaching uh, me and John up here. We're going to do a little, little worship to start out with, and then we're going to do church. We're going to do regular church. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about the Christian life. And what, what, what is really interesting about this is, listen, when, uh, when God calls you, He'll call you by name. God the Spirit will talk to you. He's not going to talk to your friends about you. He's not going to talk to your husband or your wife about you. He's not going to talk to the children about it. God specifically will call you. And you will hear it within your soul. And God will call you by name. And you will know it. Last weekend at the uh, uh, Will Graham celebration, uh, he asked people to come forward. And uh, we had a boatload of people from this ministry go forward. And the ones I've talked to, it, God called them. You know, he calls you. You will know it. When you make a decision for God, it's between you and God, not you and your mom and dad and God. It's you and God. God calls you. It is this unique thing called a personal relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, and God the Spirit. And the God the Spirit calls you and you go, oh man, the good Lord is talking to me. And that's what happens. He calls you. You will see throughout the Gospel of Mark, that, that when people believe, he calls them individually. Now, some people, they, they, they kind of answer the phone, but they don't want to really, they don't really want to talk. They don't really want to follow. They, they kind of want to do like, well, you know, can I be a Christian if, you know, I can still hang out and do this? Can I still do this stuff? And Jesus is like, no. No, you either follow me or you don't follow me. You know, you don't, get to, you don't get to play this Christianity stuff. You either love me or you don't love me. You follow me or you don't follow me. It's not easy, but that's the only way a good relationship works, amen? I mean, in your relationship as a husband and wife, would it be cool if your husband goes out, well, honey, I love you, but that chick over there is really hot. I'm going to go hang with her for a while. Oh, yeah, really? You're going to go do that? Well, you remember that pistol you bought me? I'm going to shoot you. And so you should. You get it? It doesn't work if there's not a commitment. Now, none of us are perfect, and we all get swayed one way or the other, but if you're going to be an impact person for God like these guys were, they had to be follow all in. They had to just go all out and all in. So that's what happens. He makes the call. So, yeah, we're going to go on even though it's five after because i got to get this in because you guys are going to enjoy this. So suddenly, here we go. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, they went into the synagogue, which was kind of like their church, and the Sabbath was a Saturday. And then it says, suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit, most like a demon, began shouting. And he says this, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, the religious heat of the day, they, don't fig they haven't figured it out, but the, the devil has, the demons have. They, they tried to take him down for 40 days and 40 nights. They failed miserably, and all they could do is be shaken in their boots, the evil ones going, oh, man, this is God in the flesh. He's going to take us out. And they recognize him. As these demons possess people, as Jesus walks in, they go, son of God just walked in the room. I mean, throws, we're going to see that the, the, the demons throw these people into convulsions. They beat themselves on the ground. One guy is so possessed that he breaks chains from them, and he flops all, and God just looks at the evil ones and says, come out. That's it. You're done. And isn't it amazing, what I think is very amazing, is the evil one who knows, knows Jesus Christ, doesn't believe, but knows. The demons fear and tremble at the Son of God. But what I find amazing 
is that people today do not believe at all. And yet all the evidence that God gives us that he's here. Even when they, it's funny because I've watched the Holy Spirit tug on people's hearts. And, and, and I go, how can you not know? Well, well, I just don't want to. I just don't want to. Next few weeks, we are going to see some unbelievable miracles. And they are just unbelievable. I, I love the story. I love the miracle. I don't, I don't care what anyone says. Uh, uh, the Russian woman, Natalie, right? Natalia, something like that. And uh, Genevieve from uh, like like some uh, King Arthur story. You know, Guinevere and whoever. You know, when you, Josh, you got to have a picture. You got to show people that picture. Because listen, man, it's it's. If, you, if I got hit at 85 miles an hour, you know, I'm just about 60. I'd be dead. I, I don't think I could recover. I, you know, it's pretty, so God kept you alive for a reason. To help Josh with the junior high kids. That's it. It's the only thing I could think of. No, there's, there's more to it. But it's a miracle. But what's amazing, even when we see miracles, even when we see God do amazing things, people go, yeah, no. It is my prayer that when God does amazing things in you in your life, you go, that was God. That was cool. He deserves my undivided attention, my blessings, even though he blessed us. That's the way it should go. Because Jesus, the demon slayer, he wants you to repent, believe, and radically be different as a man or a woman of God. Would you please stand? And uh, I'm going to close this in prayer. Gracious Lord, I pray that uh, everybody here that has committed their life to you would, would actually become an all-inner. That whatever you ask them they, to do, they would do. That they would not be embarrassed as as people have been about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it is the power of God unto salvation, that they would be willing to share your grace, your love, that whatever you ask them to do, wherever you ask them to go, they would be willing to do it, to go there, to be a part of it, to be, to be your light, your salt that makes this world flavorful and brings light to the darkness, that they would do so, that they would just understand that they, they need to be all in, that there's only one way to be a man of God or a woman of God, and that is to be jump in with both feet. So for the man or woman that is, has, has not done that yet, that they would, your Holy Ghost would just make them miserable till they do. My prayer is that they would do so quickly because their friends and family need to know the truth, the joy of being a Christ follower. Uh, Lord, help us not to hammer them, just, just to live the life that you've called us to live. Father, for all the blessings that you have blessed these folks with, with resources, with health, with all the abundance of life, Lord, that our hearts would be thankful and we would just be gracious and, and, and be generous to others because of it. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the grace you've given to, given to us. And uh, Lord, one day when, when I get to heaven, I get to see Mark, I can sit down and talk to him and, and just appreciate how the Holy Ghost used him to pen down this, this gospel, this truth of you to all of us. We love you. We ask uh, blessings on everybody's days. We thank you that you have a, a phenomenal plan for Genevieve and Natalie, that you kept them alive to minister your grace. So we ask that you continued blessings on their lives. We love you. We leave our lives at the most level playing field there is, the foot of the cross. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much for coming.